Soldier's Heart by Alex51324 Chapter 15 April to June 1916 The new blokes, when they arrived, looked very, very young. Even the handful who were, by the ordinary calendar, older than Thomas or his fellow corporals. It was the way they looked wide-eyed at the ambulance being offloaded nearby and flinched at the sound of the guns in the distance. Those are our guns, by the way. Collins told them. We're far enough back not to have to worry about Fitzes. Unless something goes drastically wrong up at the front, Thomas said. Several of the new men looked even more alarmed at that, so he added, It's not likely. You lot are in that tent of there, he pointed to it. Stow your kit and meet back here at fifteen for the cook's tour. The new men reported back in good time, and the corporal started calling the rosters of their new sections. Thomas was a bit surprised to find that he had two middle-aged blokes and a lad with thick spectacles, as well as one who must have gone up on his toes to meet the minimum height requirement. He quizzed them as he took them around the station, finding out that they had come from a training camp outside London and had done a bit of hospital work as part of their training. Most had worked in factories or shops before joining up. The specky one had swept up in a cinema, and one of the middle-aged ones had been a barman. They were knowledgeable enough about hospital equipment and routines, in theory at least, although several of them gulped and looked ill when Thomas took them through surgical prep in the dressing rooms, where the afternoon's delivery of new wounded were being seen to. "'This is where we'll be tomorrow,' Thomas said, taking them into A block and indicating the two wards they were assigned to. "'Men's medical?' Officers medical? He took them into men's medical. Here we get mostly minor wounds. More serious wounds are usually in surgical, so it's not one of the more difficult ones to start out on. The lightest cases may convalesce here and then go directly back to their units. Most of the others are just here for a day or two until they get moved further back. Sometimes they stay on a bit longer while the medical officers evaluate the case and decide where's best to send them. The specky one raised his hand. Yes, Thomas quickly thought back to the roster. Drover, what's happening down there? He indicated a bed at the end of the row that was partitioned off with screens. Is the patient contagious or... Thomas beckoned them back into the passageway, making sure that the door to the ward was shut behind them. Contagious cases are in the quarantine block. Screens around a bed usually means a death watch. He'd not have brought it up if no one had asked, but there was no point in whitewashing it. You see those more often in surgical, but it could be a minor wound that developed a serious infection, or sometimes they put them in the medical wards just because that's where there's space for them. Oh, said Drover quietly, you won't be handling any of those your first couple of weeks. If other patients on the ward ask, just say that the bloke is very poorly and needs quiet. Striving for a hearty tone, Thomas went on. Now, down here are the sink room and the scullery, where you'll be spending a lot of your time. Once the new men had seen all the points of interest, Thomas took them to the mess, where the rest of the section was already gathered. Rollins, why dinner? Blank, he said, indicating them. These are the new blokes. When we go on wards tomorrow, some of you will be in one ward with Rollins and Widener, and the rest will be in the other with me and Plank. You all have the same rank, but for now you should do what they tell you. Here, here, said Rollins. We four have been here a year, or close to it, so we know our way around pretty well. Then he got them talking about why they had joined the RAMC. Thomas was unsurprised to hear that several of them... The two old men, Spiky Drover, the short arse, and another bloke who apparently had a bad chest, had been rejected from other services on grounds of physical fitness. Got tired of being handed white feathers, didn't I? said Erickson, the chesty one. My older brother signed up on the 5th of August, another said. After he was killed, our mom said she couldn't stand it if I was to. She only had the two of us. I promised her I wouldn't train up, but once they started talking about conscription, he looked defiant. I'm not a coward, but I couldn't tell that to my own mum. I got her vicar to recommend me for this. No one said anything for a long moment. Clever of you, Thomas finally said. There's nothing now that's completely safe, but this is better than some. We've only lost one out of our old section. Some sections haven't lost any in the last year, Rollins added quickly. That was true, but there was also one that had lost six to a shell strike on stretcher duty. 
though two of those had lived at least long enough to be sent back to base hospitals. They might still be alive. The only dangerous part is when you go forward to collect wounded, Thomas explained, and even then, a lot of the time, you're only going as far up as the support trenches. More often than not, their own mates bring them back that far. It's not too bad. Will we have to do that? Someone asked. Everybody takes a turn at it. Thomas answered. There was no point hiding that, either. With any luck, they'd be learning enough new things today that they'd have no opportunity to dwell on it. It'll be at least a couple of weeks before you pull that duty, though, and the War Master tries to pick a quiet night for you when you're first learning. He went on to explain some more innocuous facts about the duty roster, how you usually rotated two or three weeks on wards with two or three weeks off, that off wards work was usually lighter, the on-call system for receiving convoys, and things like that. After tea, they met up with Collins and Manning's sections for drill. One of the things Thomas had noticed about drill in their time at CCS-14 was that it seemed especially ridiculous if there were only a dozen of you doing it. They were drilling by squads, with the men from the old section leading when the wardmaster turned up. Stretch and drill, he said, lighting a cigarette. Not bad idea, I suppose. Colin suggested it, Thomas explained. He hadn't been sure about it himself. Having just come from training, the new men would surely remember how to do it. But Collins had brought him round on the idea. Give them a chance to impress us a bit before they go on wards tomorrow and find out how much they don't know. It would also give Collins and Manning some practice issuing orders and allow everyone a chance to size up their new section mates before they started actually working. And we didn't want to leave them too much to their own devices the first day. The Warmaster nodded. It could be a fucking shock, this place. I've got a good decent idea of their strength, too, Thomas added. I wasn't sure about that heavy set bloke. He nodded toward the barman, who was a fleshy and red faced specimen. But he's strong as an ox and holding up all right. So is the really short one. But the other two in that squad, I'm not sure how they'll manage a stretcher in the trenches. They were within specifications, but decidedly undersized. They're getting worn out with four to a stretcher. Hmm, <laughs> said the war master. Who's dead, lads? Thomas nodded. Yeah. Sometimes the runty buggers pick up a bit once they've been getting enough to eat for a while. Keep an eye on them. Thomas had seen that happen with hall boys, but they were young enough they were still growing. All right. If they can't manage, we'll have to work around it. We were doing a lot of that before we're through. The fucking war office doesn't think the RAMC needs A ones anymore. A one was the highest ranking for physical fitness. Any others you're worried about? Thomas pointed out the asthmatic and the other older bloke who seemed to be stiffening up a bit with the work. Let's hope they're fucking clever. The warmaster said, "It's not too hard to find a place for a man who's fit and dull. Or we get clever, but we get dull's a tough one. And as the nose you got blood for them." Just getting them poked for Captain Linwood's blood gooping scheme, Thomas said. The war master shuddered. And that gives me the fucking collie wobbles. I love my blood when it is not going round some of the buggers' veins. With that, he stopped off to check in with Manning and Collins. Collie wobbles or not, the new chief of surgery wanted everyone pissed so after a drill, they reported to the surgical hut where a bored looking sergeant said, Tunics off, right shirt sleeves rolled up quickly now. As they complied, someone said, What's this about, then? Another added, We had our jabs before we crossed the channel. Blood grouping, Thomas explained. For transfusions, it's new. Captain Allenby had told him about it once, when he'd still been on night duty. Allenby was fairly keen on the project and had wanted to help out with it, but Captain Linwood had rebuffed his offer. What's that? asked Rover. If somebody loses too much blood, they can top him up with a bit from somebody else, Thomas explained. The trouble is, there's different sorts. The blood groups, and if you get the wrong one, it kills you. Captain Allenby had attempted to explain what was different about the different groups, but Thomas hadn't been able to follow it. They've known how to do transfusions and how to test for blood groups for a while, but there isn't time to do the testing when somebody's bleeding to death. Drover said, So they're checking what kind we have in case we... Not quite. They've just worked out that there's one kind you can give to pretty much anybody. So Captain Linwood is making a list of who has that kind, and if a patient needs blood, he knows who to get it from. Planks done it, he added. It's not odd, Planks said. They stick a needle in your arm with a tube that goes to the other bloke's arm, and then you just sit there for about half an hour. 
Once you're done, you get a cup of Beaufort Bill and a biscuit. The sergeant, gesturing the first of the men, it was Erickson, the asthmatic, into the chair to be jabbed, added, The captain reckons it's saved a few lives already. He swabbed Erickson's arm with alcohol. The real bugger on a busy night is gonna be sparing the men to get blood. He inserted the needle and drew out a tiny sample of blood. You've got the rest for a bit after, so while told, it ties up a man for about an hour. And they can only take about a pint per man, so you might need to bleed half a dozen men for one case. He gave Erickson a bit of bandage to hold over where he'd been jabbed and said, Next! Drover got into the chair and Thomas added, Captain Allenby said that what they'd like is to be able to collect the blood ahead of time, before a big battle, say. But they haven't worked out how to stop it going bad. Cool, said the barman, shaking his head. The things they come up with. The new men seem like a good lot. Rollins said as he and Barrow walked back to the barn that night. Barrow nodded. I suppose. We'll see you tomorrow. Rollins hesitated. You might have put the wind up them a bit talking about Lamble and going up to the front. He wouldn't have said it, but Barrow had asked him to help with things like that. He'd said that he'd asked the wardmaster especially to keep Rollins in his section for that reason. Rollins was fairly sure that Barrow had just said that to make him feel better about not being promoted to corporal, not that he wanted to be. Barrow wasn't the type to make up a white lie like that. Barrow glanced at him. You think? Maybe. Some of them asked about it at dinner. He told them that Barrow hadn't meant anything by it. It was just that he wasn't afraid of anything. Hmm. I thought it might be better if they started getting used to the idea while it was still a ways off. It took Rollins a moment to realize he meant the idea of going up to the front, not the idea of one of them being killed. Maybe so. He agreed. With the push coming, they've got to be ready, Barrow added. Have you heard anything new? They all heard things, of course, but Barrow was likelier than anyone to hear things that were actually true. He thinks it'll be June, Barrow said. He was the wardmaster, of course. Oh, Rollins had imagined Barrow hearing something about whether the offensive was likely to take place here, not when it was. That gives us some time to get ready, Barrow nodded. So, they reached the barn. Barrow went straight for his rocky chair. He'd bought it off one of the many French families who decided that with a push coming, they'd rather take their chances somewhere else. And as soon as he'd sat down, Mittens began bouncing from rafter to rafter, then dive-bombed into Barrow's lap, trilling. What do you want? Barrow asked him as the kitten climbed up his tunic under his favorite perch on Barrow's shoulder. It was typical of Barrow, Rollins thought, that even the cat adored him. When Mittens had first come to live in the barn, the rest of them had attempted to curry favor by offering sardines and dangling bootlaces for him to bat at, but the cat had only been interested in Barrow, who ignored him. Mittens had now warmed up to the rest of them, but Barrow was still his favorite. Barrow gave the cat a scratch under the chin, then lit a cigarette. Has anybody fed this lazy animal? He asked the room in general. I brought him some chicken, Collins said, but he hasn't eaten it yet. You hear that? Barrow asked Mittens. He's the one with the chicken. Mittens meowed and rubbed his head against Barrow's jaw. The new men settled in well enough. During their first weeks on wards, they did the same sort of things Thomas and his group had done back when they had been new. Making beds, cleaning bedpans, serving meals, washing dishes. Thomas made a point of looking for opportunities to show them some of the more complicated duties, having one or another of them hand him things while he was doing dressing changes, for instance, and encouraged Widener and Rollins in the other ward to do the same. Ward duties were routine enough for him now that he could keep an eye on the new men at the same time as he was doing his own work, getting an idea of their individual capacities. He learned, for example, that Hutchkins, the barman, had a knack for distracting the patients during dressing changes and other unpleasantness with questions about their lives and stories from his own pub-keeping days, but, if not reminded, would chat with the patients at the expense of other work. The little cockney lads would take on anything that was asked of them without complaint and needed a bit of watching to make sure they didn't overexert themselves unnecessarily. Babcock, the older gent with a bad back, was precise and methodical in his work, which was all right as long as it wasn't something that needed to be done quickly. Drover, with the spectacles, was a quick learner, but had a decided tendency towards squeamishness. 
These observations paid off when they were rotated off wards and Thomas was handed a list of jobs with instructions to sort his men into them. Babcock, for instance, was the obvious choice to help pharmacy stores with inventory, and Hutchkins would do well in the orderly's room, a duty Thomas had hated when it was his turn, since he wouldn't mind hearing or telling the same stories over and over again. Erickson and Drover went on clerical duties, and the Cockney lads, who weren't much good at reading and writing, to the cookhouse, where the work was tedious but not too strenuous, and the cook could be relied upon to give them extra food between meals. Halfway through the week, they had their first turn on a carrying party, taking supplies to the collecting post and bringing a few patients back, and a few days later, they went again, this time the whole way up to the aid post. Thomas was a little surprised by how much busier the trenches were. There were new guns being hauled into place and a new line of support trenches dug between the old second and third lines. The Germans had noticed the activity too and were shelling a bit more than usual. Not as much as they had on the worst nights Thomas had seen, like the one when Lamble had been killed, but more than would have been considered a quiet night last summer. The new blokes bore up fairly well. Babcock was more phlegmatic than Thomas would have guessed, grumbling about the weight of a stretcher but not taking much notice of shell strikes, and Hutchkins was flightier, frequently exclaiming things like, That was a close one, even when it wasn't. The Cockney lads, Wallace and Eakins, struggled with the weight they were expected to carry, but stayed cheerful and alert and were good at keeping their heads down. Drover came the closest of anyone to having real trouble, but after two or three unnecessary dives for cover, limited himself to flinching and swearing. Still, as Rollins reported to Thomas, everyone was fairly relieved to go back on wards, since that meant they were likely to be sent on any more carrying parties for a bit. One morning, arriving on Med's surgical, Thomas found a familiar face, a young corporal called Booth, who he'd had on one of his work details back at the CCS. Thomas had also, he remembered as he looked over the bloke's chart, getting ready to do his dressing change, been witness to one of his little chats with Major Winthrop. Booth had lost his voice after a disastrous patrol of which he had been the only survivor. The lieutenant leading the patrol had been killed along with two men early on. Command then fell to Booth, the only NCO present, and he decided to proceed with their objective. Thomas forgot what it had been. Wire cutting, probably. A machine gunner had spotted them, and the rest of the patrol had been slaughtered, Booth hiding under their dead bodies until just before dawn, when he'd crawled back to the British line. When Throb had pointed out that it had been Booth's orders, his voice that had led to the deaths of the rest of the men, and that fearing being in a position to give such an order again, his subconscious mind had settled on hysterical mutism as a solution. If he couldn't talk, he couldn't order more men to their deaths. Having this explained to him had brought back Booth's voice, but it hadn't done anything about the reason he'd stopped speaking in the first place. And now, according to the chart, he'd been brought in with a rifle wound to his foot. Accidental, the chart said. Well, Thomas certainly wouldn't be the one to question it. He cut away the old dressing, depositing it in a bowl that Hutchkins was holding for him, and examined the wound. But that hurts, he said. It was through the main part of the foot, not just a couple of toes like some of them tried. He'd been willing to pay his pound of flesh. It doesn't hurt much at first, Booth said. It's worse now. It was worse because it was going septic. The whole foot was swollen with red streaks going up the ankle. This is going to hurt even more, I'm afraid, he said, gesturing for Hutchkins to hold the bowl under it before sloshing in a liberal amount of antiseptic. Booth let out a guttural, wordless cry, followed by a curse. Sorry about that, Thomas said. Had to be done. He couldn't guess whether the surgeon would try to debride the wound, cut away the rotting flesh, or go straight to amputation, but even if it was the latter, slowing the spread of the infection would keep Booth from losing more of the leg than he had to. I'm all right, said Booth, breathing shakily. As Thomas went on cleaning the wound, Hutchkins told Booth a story about a dog that came into his pub with its master every day at six o'clock and drank its own half pint of lager out of a saucer. Thomas had heard it at least half a dozen times before and paid little attention except to notice that it was doing its job and keeping Booth's mind off his foot. Once he'd sopped up as much of the pus as he could, he packed the wound with lint and wrapped it loosely with a bit of gauze, explaining, I'm always going to want to look at that when it comes round. We'll wrap it up proper afterward. 
He left Hutchkins talking with the lad and went on to the next patient. It was only about an hour later that Captain Linwood came in for his rounds. If he'd had a choice, Thomas would have rather had one of the others. He didn't know anything to Captain Linwood's discredit exactly, but his snubbing Captain Allenby was enough to make Thomas a bit suspicious of him. His suspicions proved justified when Linwood, after studying the chart and ordering Thomas to unwrap the foot, demanded, How did this happen, Corporal? Oh, no. But luck, sir, said Booth. I was out on a patrol and had to take cover in a shell hole. As I was jumping in, my rifle got caught up in my webbing somehow. It went off as I was trying to free it. It wasn't a bad story. Unlikely, of course, but any explanation other than the obvious was going to be unlikely. If there really had been a patrol and a shell hole, it would be hard to say it hadn't happened that way. Hmm, said Linwood. He looked Booth in the eye for a moment, then mercifully let it drop. Got a bit of infection here. I expect your boot was none too clean. To Thomas, he added, we'll take him into theater this afternoon. Clean it and wrap it back up. He wrote something on Booth's chart, moved on. As Thomas was cleaning the wound again, Booth asked, So you took... Does that mean he's going to... Oh, all right. Thomas glanced at him. Hutch, hold the chart so I can see it, would you? Hutch did so, but the chart just indicated Booth's place on the surgical schedule and that he was to receive nothing by mouth until then. He didn't say. Sometimes they take you into theater just to clean it more thoroughly. Do you think that's what he's going to do? Thomas glanced up the ward at Winlud, then back at Booth's foot. The red streaks extended a bit further up his ankle now. It's hard to say. Likely he'll have to see how it looks when he starts working on it. Later, when Thomas got Booth ready to go into theater, the red streaks extended up to his calf. He wasn't too surprised when Booth came back with a stump just below the knee. That's a real shame, Hutchkins said as they settled him back into bed still under the anesthetic. Young chap like that? Thomas nodded. Keep an eye out when it comes round. See how he's taking it. Well, no. Hutchkins hesitated. Anything particular, I should say, if it takes it badly, I mean. He's going home, Thomas said. Try to get him to focus on that. For most of the rest of the afternoon, Thomas was occupied with trying to get some gruel down the neck of a man who'd lost most of his lower jaw. But he did notice Hutchkins talking to Booth for a fairly long time. The next morning, as they were heading to the ward after breakfast, Hutchkins fell in step beside him. Cool, he said. Can I talk to you about something? Feeling uneasy, Thomas nodded. Sure, let's, uh, over here. They went around to the side of the block, and Thomas lit a cigarette. What's on your mind? Don't let Booth. Thomas had been afraid of that. What about him? You said if there was anything unusual, we should tell you about it. Hutchkins said. And you'd decide if the medical officer ought to know. Right. He'd been speaking mainly of symptoms, orderly spent more time with the patients than the M.O.s did, and might be quicker to notice any change, even if they weren't sure what it meant. But he had a feeling it was a different kind of thing Hutchkins was talking about now. Uh, they said in training that if we had any reason to think a man was malingering or anything like that, would come forward. Thomas nodded. They did say that. Maybe he hoped Hutchkins had just noticed there was something a little strange about Booth's story. Maybe that was all it was. When I was talking to him yesterday after he came round from his operation, I think he was saying that he shot himself. On purpose. No. What did he say exactly? He was distraught at first about his leg. Hutchkins explained. But then he asked about his patrol. If the rest of them had made it back all right. So I told him we don't have any more of them here, if that's what he was asking. And then he said that was all right then. As long as they made it back, it was worth it. He took a deep breath. And then he said, I'd do it again if I had to. That was clearly suggestive, but not actually a confession. Sometimes they're confused when they first come round after an operation, Thomas said. He might not have known what it sounded like. Yes, cool said Hutchkins. But? But? I asked him what he meant. He said it sounded like he was saying he shot himself on purpose. No! What did he say? He didn't deny it. He just said he meant it about doing it again. 
Thomas took a deep drag from his cigarette and then another one. If you're in that situation again, he said carefully, it would be better not to ask that question. Yes, Court, I... Right then, I was a bit angry. He admitted that it was taking up our time, our medical officer's time, looking after him when he did it to himself. A warning to turn him in, if he had done it. It didn't seem like he wanted to now. But something's changed. He started saying how we had to do it. Had to. And I got to thinking about what it's like up there. I mean, I ain't looking forward to the next time we have to go. And what would it be like to be stuck there, dying and dying out, wondering every minute if it's going to be a last. Anybody could have a minute when he wasn't thinking straight. Couldn't he? Thomas nodded. I wished I hadn't asked. I don't want to get that poor lad in trouble. But I did it now that I know. You don't, Thomas said. No, you suspect. I did too, just seeing the wound, and I bet Captain Linwood did as well. You have another reason to suspect, that's all. So I don't have to do anything? Hatchkins asked hopefully. Could they sit on this? Maybe if the captain wasn't inclined to pursue it, and if Booth wasn't inclined to confess any further than he already had. But if either of those things wasn't the case, it could come out that both of them had known something more than they told. The serious shit the wardmaster had said, you pass up the chain before it sticks to you. Don't bring it up, Thomas said. If the captain asks, if he comes right out and asks whether Booth said anything more about how he came to be hurt, then you've got to tell him what you heard. But if he wants to leave it lie, follow his lead. Hutchkins nodded, looking a little uncertain. If it comes down, Thomas added, if it comes down to it, you did your duty telling me. You heard something that didn't sound quite right, you told your corporal, and I said that it sounded to me like Booth was just confused from the anaesthetic, but you did the right thing telling me, and that I'd take it from here. All right? Yes, cool. He hesitated. What if he says something else? Don't bring it up with him either. If he volunteers anything, you should tell me. He'd rather Hutchkins didn't, to be honest, but that was what he should do. If we're lucky, he'll go out on the morning convoy, and as long as no one asks any questions, it'll all be out of sight, out of mind. Even if Thomas did eventually make a report, and he should, really, it might very well end up lost in the shuffle. They were not lucky. Thomas carefully did not pay any particular attention to Booth during the morning chores, but when he started on dressing changes and worked his way around to Booth, he saw on the chart that Captain Linwood had ordered him kept for further observation. That could mean that he was worried he hadn't got all of the infection with the first operation and would have to amputate again. But he'd taken the leg not far below the knee, and the wound looked pretty clean to Thomas. How does this feel? he asked, swabbing the wound with disinfectant. Hurts less than it did, Booth answered. Good. He told you, didn't he? Booth asked suddenly. The bloke from yesterday. Thomas glanced at him. You should be careful what you say. A bloke could misunderstand. Booth didn't take the hint. I had to do it, he said. You understand, don't you? It was just like the last time the shell just as we were setting out. He'd had the stammer for a bit back at the CCS when he'd first gotten his voice back. Thomas earnestly wished that he'd go mute again before he could say anything even more incriminating. Instead, he went on. It would have ended the same way if I hadn't done something. I had to give them a reason to turn back before they were all c c killed. I, I had to, and I did do it again. He wasn't going to keep his mouth shut. That much was clear. Once Thomas had finished the dressing changes, he went looking for the wardmaster, but he was out. In a meeting with Major Thwaite, one of the sergeants said, Thomas left a note saying he wanted to talk to him urgently and went back to the ward. Shortly after he got back, Captain Linwood arrived for his morning rounds. Thomas took the precaution of making sure that Hutchkins was out of sight in the sink room and occupied himself with a patient across the aisle and a few beds down from Booth, where he would hear if Booth began confessing again, but Linwood would have to go out of his way if he wanted to speak to Thomas. That way, if the situation blew up in their faces, both Thomas and Hutchkins could plausibly claim they had, of course, intended to report this news to the M.O. in charge of the case, but simply hadn't yet found a good opportunity to do so.
Fortunately, Booth did not say anything to Linwood except, Yes, sir. And Linwood did not say anything to Thomas except to repeat the instructions from the chart that he was to be kept for observation. Thomas deliberately did not ask what they were meant to observe. Infection, obviously. They were observing the stump for signs of infection. Thomas tried looking for the ward master again at lunchtime, but he still wasn't in. Finally, when Thomas and the other orderlies were doing the patient's tea, his clerk showed up to fetch Thomas. Thank God! All day he'd been looking over his shoulder in case Linwood came back in and started asking questions. The ward master took the news with a heartfelt fuck and reached into his desk drawer for a bottle. How did he tell? He asked as he poured himself a drink. Private Hodgkins, one of the new men, and then he gave me some more details while I was changing his dressing. Fuck, he gulped it. Linwood already fucking suspects, he said. He told me just wait, wait, ask me to look into it. We can't keep this to ourselves. I was afraid of that, Thomas said. How much trouble is he in? He could end up in front of a fucking firing squad, son. The wardmaster said, here. Yeah. He dug out another glass from somewhere and poured Thomas a drink. Thomas knocked it back. Is that likely? I mean, Diggs could have too. Diggs was one of ours. Major Thwaite takes my recommendations when it comes to our men. This will go to Booth, CO. There's no telling which way he'll jump. Thomas hesitated. He's not well. Booth, I mean, we had him in the shell shock ward back at the CCS. He explained what had happened on Booth's earlier patrol. Even Major Winthrop could see the problem was he couldn't stand getting men killed under his command again. But he didn't actually help him, so he did this. Sacrificed himself so the patrol could turn back. Aye, said the wardmaster. The bugger of it is there's two ways that can look. One, he's a sick man who should never have been sent back to the line. Two, he has a history of cowardice. The trouble with version one is, it means the major fucked up. Thomas heard the wet snap of Kingston's leg. It wouldn't be the first time. Oh no, son, said the wardmaster gently. And it wasn't cowardly. If he really thought the new patrol was going to get killed, even if he only thought that because he's not right in the head, what the fuck else was he supposed to do? Oh no, the war master repeated. What are we going to do? You're not going to do anything, the war master said. I'm going to talk to Thwaite again. See if I convince him to encourage Linwood to drop it. You, avoid Linwood if you can. If he asks any questions, don't lie. But don't fucking volunteer anything. That's what I told Hutchkins, Thomas noted. You were right. He dismissed Thomas back to the ward. The rest of the afternoon passed without incident. Captain Linwood came in for afternoon rounds, but paid no particular attention to Booth or to Thomas. Thomas began to hope that the wardmaster had persuaded Thwaite, and Thwaite in turn had persuaded Linwood to stop asking questions. That hope was dashed immediately after dinner when Thomas approached the wardmaster to ask if there was any news. He shook his head but pointed toward his office. Once he'd poured them both a drink, the wardmaster said, Linwood's already sent word to the fucking battalion commander. Thwaite doesn't like it much, but there's nothing he can do. Fuck! Thomas took a large swallow of his drink. What happens next? The battalion commander sends an officer to investigate, the wardmaster said. He might want to talk to you and Hodgkins. Don't lie. He didn't, this time, say not to volunteer anything. Do I bring up Booth's shell shock? Even if the officer in question knew that Booth had been treated for it, he wouldn't know that Thomas knew anything about it. That's the big fucking question, the wardmaster said. You probably should, yeah, if they know for a fact he did it. If he fucking confesses again, the only defense he's got is that he's lonely. Thomas nodded, thinking through the next few steps. I suppose they'll talk to Major Winthrop? Yeah, I reckon so. If he takes it like a man and admits he should never have sent the poor fucker back, it'll probably turn out all right. Thomas thought about Major Winthrop the moment after that wet snap. He'd been horrified by his mistake. Thomas would bet on it. But he hadn't been horrified enough to admit anything, not until Thomas shamed him into it. He won't on his own. Somebody's got to convince him. You're not doing anything, the wardmaster said. That is a fucking order if it needs to be. Stung, Thomas stiffened his spine. Yes, sergeant. With his fucking push coming, I need you where you are, son. The wardmaster added. And we've already seen what with drops like when a corporal goes toe to toe with him. You are not sticking your neck out that far. Not now. Thomas nodded. He had a point. 
And it wasn't like Thomas could be dramatically proved right as Rouse had been. Booth had already snapped. If somebody needs to convince him, it needs to be a fucking officer. He was right about that, too. They both thought about it for a moment. Captain Allenby? Thomas suggested. He was the only officer Thomas could reasonably ask a favor of. The war master shook his head. He's got nothing to do with the case. I don't doubt he'd stick his nose in if you asked him right, but Linwood already has it in for him. Two M.O.s at each other's throats is another kind of trouble we don't need, but we're getting ready for a push. He poured himself another drink and stared at it for a moment. There's nobody at the CCS. Thomas shook his head. Fine. Figured you'd have tapped him for the other thing if there was. He sighed. I'll try Major Thwaite again. He's no fucker good at this kind of shit. Politics. But I can walk him through it if he's willing. Would he be willing? Thomas didn't ask. He suspected he wouldn't like the answer. The wardmaster leaned over and topped up Thomas's drink. Son, there may not be anything we can do here. I don't like it any better than you do. It wouldn't hurt anybody to let the poor fucker go and he's paid a high enough price for it already. But this is above my pay grade and it's sure as fuck above yours. I need you to be sensible. Understand? They'll do anything impulsive. I understand, Thomas said. He also understood that the wardmaster was having doubts about his reliability just now, and that that wasn't good. I just... He thought about Peter and his letter saying, I wasn't very brave today. His captain had at least tried to help. It had gone spectacularly wrong, yeah, and got Peter killed. But at least he hadn't just told him to buck up and get back to work. Who knew what Peter might have resorted to if he hadn't been given a chance to get away from the sound of the guns? Somebody should try to help him, that's all. We are, the warmaster pointed out. We are fucking trying, all right? He nodded. All right. The next day, Thomas put himself in officer's surgical, giving men's surgical to widener and plank, putting himself out of the way of temptation to get any more involved with the booth situation than he already was. It was almost a miscalculation. He noted somewhere along the line that Booth was from the Duke of Manchester's own, but hadn't thought anything of it. Hadn't even considered that there might be strings he could pull outside of the RAMC until Lieutenant Crawley came strolling into Officer Surgical to talk to some friend of his who was on the ward. It didn't mean he was the officer they'd sent, of course. He could simply have come to visit. But Thomas busied himself making up an empty bed a few paces down from Lieutenant Crawley's friend. If there was one thing being a footman was good for, it was knowing how to eavesdrop without being noticed. They started out talking about the big push and how Lieutenant Crawley's friend, a Lieutenant Carrington, would miss out on it seeing as he no longer had any legs. Carrington tried to pretend that Crawley was the lucky one. Eventually, he got around to asking, But you didn't come all this way just to say me, did you? No, unfortunately, said Lieutenant Crawley, I had to come and talk to one of my men. S-I-W, I'm afraid. Self-inflicted wound, that stood for. Did he mean Booth had confessed? Or just that Lieutenant Crawley believed he was guilty? Wrong luck, Carrington said. I almost had a deserter right before this. He nodded toward his stumps. But his mates brought him back in time. It's the push. It's hard to blame them. I thought his story was a little fishy. Lieutenant Crawley admitted. I wasn't going to make waves. The wound seemed bad enough to be its own punishment. But somebody here caught it. He shook his head. My major sent me to look into it. He sounded sympathetic enough, Thomas thought. And he'd promised the wardmaster he wouldn't do anything impulsive. Not that he wouldn't do anything at all. Feeling the lieutenant out on the subject just a bit, would it be sticking his neck out? Not if he was careful. Thomas contrived to be standing near the door when Lieutenant Crawley was ready to leave and noticed him then, bracing up and saying, Sir, borrow, he said. I thought that was you, and a corporal now. Congratulations. Thank you, sir, and you as well. He nodded toward Crawley's sleeves, which showed he'd been made up to first lieutenants since they last met. Oh, yes, Lieutenant Crawley said a bit vaguely. How are you keeping? Not bad, sir. He said, I hear we're in for a busy time before long, though. I should think so. They haven't told us when yet, if that's what you're wondering. Yes, sir. It hadn't been particularly. He considered his next move. He had to prolong the conversation somehow, giving himself time to maneuver around to Booth. 
It's all very different from Downton, isn't it? It seems like a dream. It does, Crowley agreed. Funny you should mention it. I meant to visit there soon, if I can get away before they cancel all leave, that is. Yorkshire in June. It's hard to believe it still exists. He started buttoning his greatcoat. It was a raw day for May, and that gave Thomas an idea. Would you like a cup of tea, sir, before you go? I'd love one if it's not any trouble. I think I can manage, Thomas said. He maneuvered Lieutenant Crawley into the scullery, where they kept a spirit stove for making tea for the officers' wards. No lukewarm slap out of Dixie's for them! And put the kettle on. Do you get much news from Downton? Lieutenant Crawley asked. Anna keeps me informed, sir, he said, spooning tea into a pot. Lady Edith's driving, Lady Sybil's training as a nurse. Lieutenant Crawley nodded. Do you suppose she's prepared for it? The kind of things she'll see? That was an opening, maybe. Were any of us? I certainly wasn't, Lieutenant Crawley said ruefully. I spent the winter at the CCS, Thomas went on. We had nurses there, young ladies. They rose to it. Of course, they have to prove themselves to be posted overseas. They only send the best and bravest. Not like us men. We get sent here to sink or swim. Yes, said Lieutenant Crawley. And not everyone is a strong swimmer. No, sir, Thomas agreed, pouring water from the kettle into the teapot. They mostly had us working with the nervous cases at the CCS. They didn't want the ladies looking after them in case they babied them too much. In a pitiful state, some of them were. I'm sure. One of my men, the one I came here to see, was treated for that sort of trouble. I wonder if it was the same place. A chap called Booth. Yes, sir, Thomas said, pouring the tea into a cup. I recognized him when I saw him here. As Thomas handed in the teacup, Lieutenant Crawley met his eyes. Did you? Thomas nodded. Crawley sipped at the tea. That's nectar. You know, when he came back, Booth, I mean, my sergeant wasn't convinced he was quite recovered from the trouble with his nerves. Obviously, Thomas thought, or he'd hardly have shot himself, would he? I'm not sure it's my place to say about that, sir, he said carefully. But I did get the impression, when I was there, that the psychiatrist, Major Winthrop, was under a certain amount of pressure to get men back to the line quickly, and the number of patients that he was responsible for made it impossible for him to spend a great deal of time with any particular one. I see, said Lieutenant Crawley, those sound like conditions in which even the most knowledgeable officer could make a mistake. Indeed, sir. Thomas hesitated. He was fairly confident that he and Lieutenant Crawley were reading from the same page of the hymn book, but the next bit was still a bit tricky when he didn't know how much Booth had told Lieutenant Crawley. If Booth hadn't confessed, he had to avoid putting the lieutenant in a position where he'd be forced to inquire into what he'd told Thomas. At the CCS, I gathered that his nervous troubles began, or became obvious at least, after a patrol in which everyone else was killed. I think so, Crawley agreed. I was assigned to the platoon afterwards. Their previous lieutenant was one of those killed. But that's what I heard. It sounded fairly ghastly, in fact, and I believe that the night he acquired his wound was his first time going out on a patrol since coming back from his treatment. That would certainly explain why he picked that occasion to shoot himself. But Thomas couldn't comment on that, not if there was still officially some doubt whether he had shot himself. I noticed, having been involved with this care before, that he seemed preoccupied with the earlier patrol, talking about it a lot. Yes, Crawley said. He spoke of it to me as well. In fact, I might go so far as to say he was mixing up the two in his mind. Thomas wasn't sure that was quite true, not from what Booth had said to him or Hodgkins, but the more confused Booth was made out to be, the better, he supposed. Lieutenant Crawley added, for one thing, he was dreadfully relieved to see me alive. Tossing back the rest of his tea, he stood up. It may happen that I need to ask you in detail about any statements Booth made to you. That answered that question. If Booth had confessed, there'd be no need to look into what he'd said to anyone else. Yes, sir. I hope not, he added. The ambiguity of the circumstances surrounding his injury and his history of nervous troubles strike me as two good reasons to pursue the matter no further. But my battalion commander may see it differently. In the meantime, you might think back to when you cared for him at the CCS and see if you recall anything else which could be relevant. I will, sir, Thomas agreed. Later, as they were leaving dinner, Thomas told the wardmaster, I found our officer, 
He looked confused for a moment. Apparently, it was one of those days when he'd started his drinking early. Then said, Oh, it's for the booth, bugger. Come and tell me about it. They reconvened along with Jessup in the Warmaster's office. Once Thomas had explained who Lieutenant Crowley was, the Warmaster said, From the Fargo Regiment. That's perfect. Lynn would kind of object to that. Thomas nodded. It sounded like he's going to urge the battalion commander to drop it. But if he doesn't agree, he'll pursue the shell shock angle. Good, the Warmaster said, topping up the drinks. You think he's reliable, then, this Crowley? He seems a sharp lad, Jessup said, then corrected himself. A sharp young officer, that is. I got to look at him while we were at the aid post. Barrister, isn't he? Solicitor, Thomas said. A barrister would have been much more nearly acceptable. Carson, he's all right. The Warmaster knocked back his drink. If we're lucky, he'll take care of it from here on out, and we won't have to fuck around with it anymore. They weren't lucky. Two or three days later, Lieutenant Crawley turned up again. This time, Thomas was in men's surgical, and while he was unfortunately not near enough to Booth's bed to hear what they said, and there was nothing he could possibly be doing in the vicinity, he noted that it was not an easy conversation. At one point, Booth's voice rose enough for Thomas to hear him say, <laughs> I... <laughs> and... Two. Not long after that, Lieutenant Crawley got up from the chair at Booth's bedside, delivered a final remonstrance, and started for the door. Thomas managed to intercept him there, his arms full of dirty linen, and said, Sir? Corporal, Lieutenant Crawley said with a nod. He hadn't really come up with a plan for how to pump the lieutenant for information. Stalling for time, he glanced back at Booth. Finally, he said, Has anything been settled there yet, sir? Crawley sighed. I'm afraid not, he hesitated. In fact, is there some place out of the way we could go for a smoke? If you have a moment, that is. Oh, of course, sir. Let me just get rid of this. Once he had dumped the linen into the laundry bin, he showed Lieutenant Crawley out, taking him around to the far side of the building, where he went when he wanted a minute to himself. Mr. Matthew leaned against the wall and took out a silver cigarette case, saying, No joy for Major Winthrop, I'm afraid. Thomas had never seen Mr. Matthew smoking anything but an after-dinner cigar, but he supposed it wasn't much of a surprise that he'd taken up the habit here. No? he asked, reaching for his own cigarettes. No. So I came back here hoping Booth would give me something else to hang a defense on. When Lieutenant Crawley opened the case, Thomas saw that it had Lady Mary's picture inside. Instead, he essentially confessed. He lit the cigarette and sat around it. So I was hoping you might have another idea. My major isn't overly keen on pursuing this, but he's got to have some kind of reason not to, especially now that Booth's not sticking to his story. Lighting his own cigarette, Thomas thought quickly. Unfortunately, he came up empty. He didn't know what could constitute a defense in this kind of situation. The wardmaster might be able to think of something, he suggested. Sergeant Major Tooley, that is. Hmm, Crawley said. Thomas thought some more. Can I ask what happened with Major Winthrop, sir? Maybe there was a way they could try him again. Of course. I wrote to him explaining what had happened and asking if Booth may have still been suffering from shell shock. He replied that he remembered the case well, and he was certain that Booth was completely sound when he left. That didn't sound too bad. Perhaps if he examined him again, sir? Thomas hazarded. He also wrote that he was sure I didn't realize what a grievous insult it was to suggest that he could make stake a sick man for a well one, or that he'd allow external pressures to compromise his professional judgment, so we'd have a look at this time. Lieutenant Crowley popped on his cigarette. So I'd say he's dug his heels in pretty firmly. Thomas scoffed and muttered, Might change his tune if somebody whispered Kingston in his ear. Lieutenant Crowley asked what he meant by that, of course, so Thomas explained about the man who'd had a broken leg, and Winthrop insisted he hadn't. The good doctor thought he had shell shock when he didn't, so I don't see how we can pretend he couldn't have made a mistake in the opposite direction. And it definitely rattled him when he realized how badly he got it wrong. First sign of real human feeling I'd seen in the blighter. Remembering who he was talking to, Thomas added, Begging your pardon, sir. Lieutenant Crowley made a dismissing gesture. I could see how being reminded of it would humble him, he said musingly, but it'd be a difficult thing to slip into a conversation. I don't remember anyone by that name in our regiment, so I can't pretend I'm asking after him. No, he wore a Londoner, Thomas said. Crawley puffed on his cigarette some more. 
You were there with him when this chap's leg broke the rest of the way through. I was, Thomas said. Suppose you weren't with me to talk to him. The sight of you might be enough to recall the incident to his mind. That could work, Thomas nodded slowly. We'd come up with some excuse. You were involved with his care there and here, so it doesn't need to be particularly plausible. In fact, it may even help things if he sees through it. If he knows that I know that his professional judgment isn't as impeccable as he pretends. In fact, Thomas suggested, if the poor bloke ends up in front of a court-martial, who's to say the other story won't up being dragged out in the bargain? It could, Lieutenant Crowley agreed. Will you be able to get away? If I can borrow a motor from somewhere, it won't take long, a couple of hours. I expect I can manage, Thomas said. He wasn't due for an afternoon off for a while, but he could speak to the war master and... Oh, now. Actually, sir, it's going to be difficult, he said. He could pretend he needed the time off for something else. But what? And if he was found out? Well, he wasn't sure what the ward master would do, but he was certain he wouldn't like it. I had forgotten, but the ward master specifically ordered me not to confront Major Winthrop about this matter. Oh, said Lieutenant Crowley. Damn! I'm not sure I dare countermand the order of a master sergeant in my own regiment, let alone a different call. He's not sympathetic, then? No, he is, Thomas said. He just doesn't want me risking my stripes this close to the bush. He thought for a moment. Do you need to get back soon, sir? No, I have the afternoon for this. We're in rest camp. Why? The war master might come round if we explain you're the one doing the actual confronting, sir, Thomas said. Or he may have some other idea of how to remind the Major about Kingston. I don't know if he's free, but we can go and check. I just need to nip back inside and leave someone else in charge. Lieutenant Crawley agreed to this plan, and a few moments later, Thomas was leading him across the station. If the war master is in his office, it's probably best I go in first, sir, and... Explain things. Given the war master's feelings about Rupert's, Thomas didn't think he ought to spring one on him unawares. And, uh... Just so you know, his language may not be quite what you're used to. Lieutenant Crowley gave him an amused look. I've been a soldier for nearly two years now, Barrow. I'm quite accustomed to the Anglo-Saxon monosyllables. Right, Thomas still thought of him as belonging to Downton. Right you are, sir. I'm not sure what I was thinking. <laughs> it's all right. It's very strange, isn't it? Seeing people here that one knows from somewhere else. It is indeed, sir. Thomas agreed. They walked on for another moment, and Thomas thought of something else he ought to warn the Denet Crowley about, it being well past noon and creeping close to tea time. Another thing, sir, if he offers you a drink, the war master, I mean, I shouldn't recommend trying to keep up with him. No one can. Do they know it? said Lieutenant Crowley. For lack of any better ideas, Thomas decided to stash Lieutenant Crawley in the linen room while he went off to beard the ward master in his den. He found the office door partway open, which was a good sign, and heard no shouting or swearing coming from behind it, which was also a good sign. Once he knocked, announced himself, and been admitted in, he found the ward master seated at his desk going over paperwork. What is it, son? Lieutenant Crawley's here about the booth matter, Thomas explained. He said a bit of a snag and we were hoping you'd have some ideas about a way round it. What kind of a fucking snag? Major Winthrop isn't being very cooperative. What a fucking surprise. Thomas added, and now Booth has, in the lieutenant's words, essentially confessed. Muzzle of a muggering fuck anything else. Crawley says the Major of the Battalion isn't particularly eager to pursue it, but he needs some kind of excuse not to. The War Master sat back in his chair. Well, that gives us something to fucking work with. He started buttoning up his tunic. All right, bring the bugger in if you fucking must. He said, giving the room a quick scan that Thomas had little difficulty recognizing as making sure there was nothing obviously incriminating in view. Thomas went back to fetch Lieutenant Crawley and found him in conversation with Corporal Ludlow, who was linen while at the moment, and clearly a little perturbed to have found an officer lurking in his area of responsibility. Huh, Thomas said. There you are, sir. The war master is ready to see you. Very good, said Lieutenant Crawley. Uh, good luck with the bolster cases, he added to Ludlow, and escaped. As they walked down the hall, he explained, 
I'm afraid he got the impression I was here about some missing linen, and nothing I said could quite convince him otherwise. We don't get many officers in this building, sir, Thomas said in explanation. Officers' country was on the other side of the ward huts in what had been the headmaster's house when this was a school. Here we are. Thomas had wondered whether the wardmaster would actually stand up when Lieutenant Crowley entered. He was supposed to technically never mind that he'd been in the army when the officer was in nappies. But the wardmaster had solved that problem by just so happening to already be on his feet when they arrived. Fortunately, Lieutenant Crowley also grasped the delicacy of the situation. He opened by saying, Master Sergeant, thank you for letting me drop in on you. I'm sure you're very busy thus signaling his understanding that he wasn't the one in charge here. That settled, the wardmaster invited them to sit. Thomas was unable to avoid thinking of what Carson would say if he knew that Thomas was sitting in the presence of the future Earl of Grantham. And Lieutenant Crawley began explaining the latest developments in the situation, concluding with, Corporal Barrow explained the matter with Kingston back in the winter, and we both thought that reminding him of it, might have the effect we're looking for, but we haven't got any good ideas for how to pull it off, so to speak. The wardmaster gave Thomas a look of great skepticism. We did think of the obvious, Thomas said primly, but I explained I've been expressly forbidden from doing that very thing. I'm glad you fucking remember, the wardmaster said. All right, let's think about this. In due course, they moved over to the chairs by the fireplace, and the wardmaster brought out the bottle of Armnigak. Thomas watched Lieutenant Crawley suppress any show of surprise at its quality, and also thought that at this point, Carson would be spinning as his grave, if only it was dead. He was likely having palpitations without knowing why. The thing is, Lieutenant Crawley said, holding out his glass in response to the wardmaster's tipping the bottle in his direction. The Kingston situation is, in fact, entirely germane. If Booth were to offer his nervous condition as a mitigating circumstance, it's quite likely that Major Winthorpe would be called to give his medical opinion. At that point, if I were the prisoner's friend, and I very well might volunteer for it if it comes to it, the best move I could make would be to cast doubt on the Major's professional judgment. But he's already got his back up, and if I try to explain that, he's likely to think I'm threatening him. Because you are. Thomas thought, but managed not to say. He was doing a better job of avoiding refills than Lieutenant Crawley was, but then he had a great deal of practice. Why, said the warmaster, he's a dodgy bugger by all accounts. I say work around and move for good, but he's the only psychiatrist in the fucking fourth army area. I checked. They went round and round on the subject for close to an hour, but in the end, not even the warmaster could think of a solution other than the obvious one. I suppose... He finally said to Thomas, You know how to play it without getting yourself into trouble. And you, he said to Lieutenant Crawley, would do all the talking. Absolutely, Crawley said, pronouncing it carefully. He could just stand there with a look of silent reproach, like Molly's ghost. Don't you think that will work? He asked Thomas. Thomas was fairly sure that Marley's ghost had talked, but said only, I believe it would, sir. Honesty? and the desire to cover all his angles, compelled him to add, Of course, if the Major asked me a direct question, I'd have to speak, but not otherwise. If he does ask you any fucking questions, the Warmaster said, You say as little as fucking possible. Yes, sir, if you can get away with it. You know the drill. I do, Thomas acknowledged. What'll you say if he asks you if you think Booth was still gaga when he left? That was an easy one. It's not my place to say about that, sir, Thomas recited. How are you going to bring up Kingston? That was a trick question. I'm not. He hesitated. I did wonder if I might be able to get away with asking if he's heard anything, whether he's walking again. The warmaster shook his head. You were right the first time, son. Thomas had thought as much. They decided on tomorrow afternoon for the operation. The warmaster stipulated that Thomas had to be back in time for the evening convoys, and Lieutenant Crawley wanted to do it as soon as possible, lest his regiment be returned to the front ahead of schedule. Lieutenant Crawley turned up the next day in a very battered French motor car. Thomas was relieved to see it was driven by the lieutenant's batman, a man named Davis. Thomas wasn't sure where he'd have been expected to sit if Lieutenant Crawley was driving, but in the circumstances it was plain he was meant to be up front with the driver. Although Lieutenant Crawley did end up leaning forward, thrusting his head and shoulders between the two front seats to talk strategy as they went, 
He'd rather cleverly sent a message ahead telling Major Winthrop to expect him, but left no time for a reply. Thomas was able to name the places he'd be most likely to be found, thus sidestepping the necessity of asking anyone who might have been instructed to say that the Major had no time to meet with Lieutenant Crawley. They found him in the second place on Thomas's list, a little room in D-Block, where he wrote up his charts and case notes. Major, I'm Lieutenant Crawley, he began. Yes, Winthrop said, still writing on the chart in front of him. I'm sorry I came all this way, but there's really nothing. When he finally looked up from what he was doing, the effect was immediate. Not dramatic. Just a slight backward movement of his head and a running of color from his face. But immediate. One point from Marley's ghost, then. The major recovered himself and continued. I'm not sure what I can add. I can understand. Lieutenant Crawley said, but it is looking as though if the matter comes to a court-martial, nervous debility would be the defence. In that event, you'd likely be called to give medical advice. I see, said Winthrop. His eyes flicked up to Thomas. If it did come to that, I would, of course, need to examine him again. Naturally, Lieutenant Crawley agreed. It's very unfortunate, of course, if he did harm himself, the Major continued. He showed no sign of that behaviour here, just the, uh... Historical mutism. He glanced at Thomas again, which cleared up fairly quickly once I was able to explain to him the psychological mechanism which caused it. Yes, Lieutenant Crawley said. I find that very interesting. Let me see if I understand it correctly. In essence, he blamed his voice for the loss of his patrol because he spoke the orders which led to their deaths. At Leibniz times, yes. All subconsciously, of course. That's what we call a defense mechanism against the overwhelming guilt that he felt over what happened to his comrades. By losing the ability to speak, he could avoid having to give such an order again. Hmm, Lieutenant Crowley said. But then he was returned to the line, and in due course he was sent out on another patrol, where he could very well have been called upon to give such an order. So the defense didn't work. No, Major Winthrop agreed. It was never a rational process, so one wouldn't expect it to work. The goal of treatment in these kinds of cases is to remove the defense mechanism and then confront the mental conflict which created it. I see. And can you help me to understand what that mental conflict was in Booth's case? Thomas thought it was fairly obvious what the conflict was, but was curious to hear what Winthrop would say about it. Well, the conflict between his military duty to accomplish the objective of any given operation with a natural human impulse to preserve the safety and well-being of one's friends and associates. Winthrop said, And one's self, of course. I'm sure you felt that conflict yourself. I have, Lieutenant Crawley admitted. It's a very difficult thing, sending men into danger. At must be, Major Winthrop agreed. Thomas wondered if he didn't realize that when he certified his patients fit to return to duty, he was doing exactly that. But most men, like yourself, are able to resolve the mental conflict and do their duty. Lieutenant Crawley nodded. So that would be the final step in the treatment. First remove the defense mechanism, then confront the mental conflict, and finally resolve it. Correct. And Corporal Booth resolved his conflict. Major Winthrop hesitated. This time he didn't look at Thomas. He looked everywhere else instead. I believed that he had. That's why I certified him as fit to return to active duty. It seems to me that it would be a very difficult conflict to resolve, Lieutenant Crawley pointed out. I'm not sure I could put my hand on the Bible and testify that I had resolved it myself. Mostly, I try not to think about it. I suppose that's a defense mechanism as well. Oh, no way, Major Winthrop said. But it's a, for lack of a better word, normal defense mechanism, while something like historical mutism is a pathological one. Suppose that a man had put aside a pathological defense mechanism, but not entirely resolved the mental conflict that produced it, Crawley said musingly, and then he was put into a situation which reminded him strongly of the situation in which his defense mechanism arose. Might he develop another pathological defense mechanism? The major hesitated. It might. I wouldn't want to speculate about whether it had or had not happened in any particular case. Of course. I suppose if I were explaining it to a jury, I was a solicitor before the war, you see, so I think in those terms, I might suggest that it's a bit like, say, if the man had broken his leg and it wasn't allowed to heal fully, 
It could easily break again, even under a relatively minor stress, which would be quite safe for a healthy limb. Oh, well, fucking done, Mr. Matthew. Thomas thought as Major Winthrop looked up at him sharply. Thomas kept his face blank, but gave a minute nod. Yes, you fucker, he knows. Do you think, Lieutenant Crawley continued innocently, that such a comparison would help a panel of laymen to understand? Major Winthrop swallowed hard. Yes, he said carefully. I would say that the comparison is very apt. Thomas rather thought he could have left it there, but Lieutenant Crawley twisted the neck a bit. And I could further say that the unresolved mental conflict could be quite difficult for even an expert to spot, just as an expert could easily overlook a partially broken leg. He paused significantly. I suppose, before I tried that one out in court, I'd want to look at how readily the medical professional could overlook a thing like that. Of course, Major Winthrop said. He spent a moment busily tidying the papers on his desk and avoiding looking at Thomas. Finally, he did look at him and said, Corporal Barrow, is it? Yes, sir, said Thomas. I have to admit, I'm a little curious what you're doing here. That wasn't a direct question, so Thomas kept his fucking mouth shut as ordered. After a moment, Lieutenant Crawley said, Corporal Barrow has been looking after Corporal Booth since his injury. I asked him to come along in case there was anything he could share with you about how Booth is doing, particularly since he has some experience with your methods of treatment. I see. Winthrop tidies his papers again. And what is your professional opinion of the curse, Corporal Barrow? Thomas resisted the impulse to say that his professional opinion was, You really fucked the dog, sir. I'm sure it's not my place to say, sir. Please, said Major Winthrop. I'm eager to hear your thoughts. Fuck. Thomas thought very carefully before saying, Well, sir, I don't know very much about these things, but it seems like an unresolved mental conflict would be a lot easier to miss than a broken leg. Major Winthrop drew in a breath and Thomas hurried on before he could say anything, and Corporal Booth could well have died from an injury like that. Blood loss, infection, shock. Kingston could have died from any of those things, too. If he'd been thinking clearly, he'd have realized that just as Winthrop might have realized there was something physically wrong with Kingston if he thought clearly and not allowed himself to be distracted by righteous indignation over having his judgment questioned by a mere corporal and one with a dreadfully working-class accent to boot. Major Winthrop nodded slowly, managing to look both annoyed and chastened at the same time. Satisfied that he'd made his point, Thomas moved on. And with the understanding that I'm only speaking as a layman who's seen a number of these cases. I'd say he hasn't seen me thinking too clearly since he came to the station with his wound, sir. For one thing, if he'd been thinking clearly, he'd have realized that the best thing he could do was stick to his story. What have you observed? That gives the impression he's not thinking clearly. He's said several times in my hearing that his injury, however he got it, Save the rest of his patrol from being killed, and that he'd accept it again, even knowing that he'd lose his leg. A man who was well in his mind might sacrifice himself to save his mates, but as far as I know, his patrol wasn't in any particular danger at the time of his injury. We won't, Lieutenant Crawley added, no more than any patrol. He hadn't been asked a question, but Thomas, with a mental apology to the wardmaster, added, If he did hurt himself, he thought he was doing it to save them. I don't call that cowardice, sir. I won't say it's rational, but it isn't cowardly. Major Winthrop rubbed his chin. That does cast a different light on the situation, and he's expressed this motivation consistently. Yes, sir. He said it to me as well, Lieutenant Crawley added. Well, said Winthrop, as I said, I would have to examine him again before I could give an official medical opinion. But it does sound as though he most likely suffered a relapse of his nervous difficulties under the strain of going out on a patrol again. After that, it was pretty much over, though Major Winthrop and Lieutenant Crawley sparred a bit more about the next moves. Winthrop was keen to have Booth sent back to the CCS so he could examine him. Thomas thought that would be a bad idea, as Winthrop might reverse direction as soon as Marley's ghost was out of his sight, but he didn't say anything and Lieutenant Crawley countered with the suggestion that Winthrop come to the 47th, because Booth was still recovering from surgery, of course. 
In fact, patients were usually considered ready to be moved within a day or two of amputation, but Thomas supposed Lieutenant Crawley might not know that. And even if he did, it wasn't the point. They settled on Major Winthrop writing a letter in which he explained his newly developed position on the case, with the caution that it was tentative pending examination of the patient, should a formal diagnosis be required. Excellent, said Lieutenant Crawley. We'll just stroll the grounds while you write it. Very pleasant spot you have here. Thomas suspected that Major Winthrop had not been thinking of writing the letter immediately, but he acquiesced and Thomas and the Lieutenant Crawley began their stroll. Given the choice, Thomas would have left the Lieutenant to his own devices and gone in search of a cup of tea and a bit of gossip, but he supposed it wasn't too bad of a way to pass the time. With summer almost upon them, the trees were blooming, and the grass between the graveled paths was green and lush. If you managed to avoid looking at the wounded, you could almost think there wasn't a war. They walked past a work party, most of them in hospital blues, setting plants in a flower bed. Lieutenant Crawley gave them a curious look, and Thomas explained, Nervous cases, I expect, sir. Wholesome work in the outer doors. Supposed to be good for them. Oh, most of what we did with the patients when I was here in the winter was leading them on work parties. We gravel most of these paths and painted a couple of those buildings. He indicated them. I suppose it makes a nice change to create something instead of destroying it for a change. Crawley mused. Thomas decided not to mention the grave digging. No need to spoil his illusions. Good God, is that a tennis court? It is, sir. Thomas had led them toward the side of the grounds that had the parade ground and tennis court, rather than the cemetery. How much use does that see, I wonder? Lieutenant Crawley said. Oh, I think you'd be surprised, sir, how many tennis fans there are among the other ranks. When the nurses get a tournament going, it's standing room only for spectators. I see, Lieutenant Crawley said, amused. Well, I suppose it does no end of good for morale. Indeed, sir. They crested a small hill and stood looking out over the farms and village below the station grounds. It really is very pleasant here, Crawley observed. It reminds me a bit of Yorkshire, in fact. I suppose there's something in that, sir, Thomas agreed. It was farming country, after all. As bad as all this is, at least we know home is still there, Crawley added. Imagine being one of the French army chaps from a village that's already been bombed off the map. Even when it finally ends, they won't be able to go home. Thomas nodded, carefully not thinking about where he'd go when it finally ended, if it ever did. Did you know Cousin Robert, Lord Grantham, I mean, is still saying he'd like to be sent over here? Thomas wondered if Lieutenant Crawley was alluding to the words Thomas had had with his lordship on the subject before leaving for the army himself. I did not, sir, he said. He has some sort of home service post, largely honorary, I think, so he's in uniform, but... He shook his head. It doesn't seem to be on Blaster, either. He's pulling every string he's got, trying to get properly back into the army. He can't know what he's asking for, and I feel I ought to tell him somehow, but... There aren't words for it. Not really. Thomas chewed the matter over for a moment before deciding that most of what he wasn't thinking was too impertinent to say. I've thought the same, sir, when it comes to William, the other footman in Downton. He promised his father he'd wait to be called up, but apparently he's quite keen. I've often thought I ought to warn him. I've sat down to write the letter once or twice, but I can't sort out how to begin. Besides, unlike Lord Grantham, William was likely to end up in France, even if he did come to understand that he shouldn't want to. And William probably wouldn't believe anything he had to say on the subject anyway. A short while later, they collected the letter from Major Winthrop. It was sealed in an envelope, and as they walked to the motor, Lieutenant Crawley said, "'With any luck, this will be the end of it.' "'I hope so, sir,' Thomas said. "'Do you think it's likely?' "'It could still come to a court-martial.' Lieutenant Crawley nodded. "'As long as you wrote what we discussed, it should be enough to make it come out right.' Thomas dared to say, "'Shall we stop at the 47th and steam it open, sir?' Lieutenant Crawley chuckled. "'Tempting, but we better not.' I does say we've pushed things far enough for one day. As they got into the motor, Thomas reflected that, looked at a certain way, he and Lieutenant Crawley, he and the future Earl of Grantham, in fact, had just conspired to cover up a crime. Not a crime either of them had admitted, but still, he wondered if Bates and the present Earl had anything like that between them. 
A day or two later, Lieutenant Crawley returned to the 47th to say his farewells to Booth before he was sent back to base and from thence to Blighty and a medical discharge. He explained when Thomas invited him into the ward scullery for another cup of tea that his major had thought it best to spare Major Winthrop the embarrassment of admitting in a court-martial that Booth's return to the line had been a mistake. That, Thomas said carefully, sounds like a satisfactory result for all concerned, if it's not impertinent of me to say. Typical that the major would care more about another major having to admit in public he'd, to borrow Ralph's phrase, fucked the dog, than about Corporal Booth being on trial for his life. But he supposed Booth would be glad to put it all behind him, whatever the reason. Not least for us, Lieutenant Crawley said. I do believe we did the right thing, but I'll be glad if I don't have to go out on a limb like that again. His tone was jocular, but Thomas wondered if there was a bit of warning in it, that he'd better not count on Lieutenant Crawley for any more favors in future. As would I, sir. A couple of weeks later, Matthew was at Downton Abbey. It was as surreal as he'd expected, seeing that enormous house standing more empty than not, and grown men and women with nothing more important to do than taking people's coats or bringing them cups of tea. William was on hand to open the door for him and Carson to show him into the library. I see William's not been called up yet, Matthew noted. Not yet, sir, Carson said, though I fear it could be any time now. The library was empty. The ladies, presumably, were still getting dressed for dinner. Speaking of footmen, I saw Thomas not long ago. Did you, sir? At the dressing station, Matthew explained, although Carson had not sounded particularly interested. There was a difficult situation with one of my men, and Thomas was rather helpful. Carson harumphed. I have been given to understand that the war has improved him, sir. It's difficult to imagine this war improving anyone. Matthew noted, reminding himself that Carson couldn't possibly know what he was saying. No one could know what it was like who hadn't been there. But I get the impression they quite rely on him there. I suppose so, Carson said archly. In war, one must do all sorts of things that one would rather not. Matthew had been the butt of a number of sly remarks from Carson during his early visits to the Abbey and suspected that the terrible thing he was alluding to was being forced to rely on Thomas. But it seemed best to pretend he hadn't noticed. It does seem quite terrible work, even worse than the hospital here, as the patients come in directly from the trenches. But the Master Sergeant, the man in charge of the orderlies, has great confidence in him. There had been a definite undercurrent in the meeting with Master Sergeant Tooley that he was dropping everything to discuss their problem, not to mention sharing his excellent liquor, not because an insignificant subaltern had asked him to, but because Corporal Barrow had. That sort of thing can make a hard job feel a bit easier. Was it Matthew's imagination, or did Carson go even stiffer than usual as that barb hit home? Doubtless, sir. Will there be anything else? With a glance around the library, as far from the chaos and filth of the trenches as anything on earth, Matthew said, Thank you. I have everything I need.